Good morning. Today is Sunday, August 4th, 2024, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. This morning, Pastor Williams share a message based on Luke 17, verses 11 through 17, entitled Dejutje, or Thank You in Polish. We pray that the message this week blesses you with the encouragement of the week to come. Our scripture lesson from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 17, entitled in our Common English Bible, Jesus Heals a Samaritan. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with skin diseases approached him, keeping their distance from him. They raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, Weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see everybody uh, today, and uh, thank you to all of those who are visiting. Our sermon title this morning is Jankuje. And Jankuje is a Polish term that means thank you. It's a term that got ingrained in my memory bank and in my vocabulary when I studied abroad and did some mission work in Poland. I was studying on the Holocaust and compassion studies. And of course, I was someplace for about four weeks working and serving, and I did not know the language. So thank you was the language that I used. It's also the same thing I did the first time I went to Peru. And the only thing I kept saying, gracias, gracias. So in Poland, it was dziękuję, dziękuję, everywhere I went. And because this was my primary mode of communicating without the ability, without an interpreter with me present, I sort of became over the days and weeks that I was there, became more and more excited to be able to say, Thank you. I became sort of consumed and focused with expressing thanks, whether we were in a restaurant or um, visiting a concentration camp or studying Polish history or just interacting with people um, in the streets on our uh, going and coming from the hotel and places. I never missed the opportunity to say thank you. It's oftentimes so amazing how you become so fixated on one thing but I became fixated on expressing gratitude because gratitude was the only language that I knew and I wonder what transformation might take place if we became consumed with expressing gratitude as I was looking at um this text I wanted to sort of give you a basis as for who it is we're talking about here. So there's 10 lepers and in this day and in this time, uh, they were um, on the margins of the culture. They would be what you would consider to be marginalized people. Uh, they could not uh, be amongst everyone because of their skin condition and uh, the possibility of contaminated others. They were not just expel from culture, but from their families. Um, they could not go into temples to worship the way anyone else worshiped. So it's not just being expelled just from the culture, it's being expelled and on the margins of every place that you get to do life. 
And so essentially what happened is they all did life together. And because they did life together, um, they were always around someone who also had leprosy that was in that same condition and same state. They were uh, excluded socially and religiously. And the text tells us that they were in this in-between place between um, Samaria and Galilee. They was in this in-between place, sort of this border place. And it sort of gives us an indication of what's to come because you have a marginalized people living in a space, in, uh, geographically speaking, that's on a border. I begin to think about these people and this group of individuals who had the tenacity to recognize that their condition could be healed and could be attended to by one person. I think it's so refreshing to know that when you have a problem or situation or condition that exists in your life, that you can find the answer in Jesus. I think it's so refreshing to know that there is an answer in one place. It's oftentimes what brings a lot of anxiety and difficulty is not knowing where the answer lies, not having a plan, not knowing where you can get a solution. But these lepers saw Jesus and rather than approach him, because that was not allowed, they yelled out and called out to him from afar off. They knew where the answer was. They anticipated Jesus's arrival and they shouted out. They were not afraid to expose themselves. They were not afraid to reach out and tell Jesus exactly what it is that they needed. I think there's something very brave about knowing that you have an issue and you know where to get the answer is. And no matter how other people might be looking at you or judging you or even coming to conclusions about who you are and what you are in the culture, that they had enough bravery in this situation to be able to call out to Jesus and say, Jesus, have compassion on us, have mercy on us. I wonder what would happen with us, with our very various conditions and our various issues and ways of life when we need help if we would just recognize that Jesus is in fact the answer he is in fact the one that holds our future in his hand but yet if we would just have the bravery and the discipline to call out to him to call out to his name and ask him to have mercy on us we are no different from the lepers there is something in our lives something that we're struggling with that makes us feel excluded from one area of the culture or another. Maybe it's financial exclusion. Maybe it's cultural exclusion. It's something and somewhere in our own space in life that makes us feel like I need answers. And so these leper, this leper calls out, these lepers call out to Jesus and Jesus miraculously gives them a specific directive. He says, Go show yourselves to the priest. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't go up to him. He doesn't pray some long, elaborate prayer. He doesn't extend his hand and get real spiritual. He doesn't do any of that. He simply gives them an instruction. And the instruction he gives them is, go show yourselves to the priest. In this time, it was the priest who determined and declared you unclean. If you had a little mark on you that showed that you were uh, contaminated or exposed to leprosy, the priest would take a look at you and recognize that and he would decide whether or not you in fact had leprosy so that you would be expelled from the culture. And only the priest could allow you back into the culture to say that you were healed or you were whole in some kind of way. And so he told them, go show yourselves to the priest. He didn't say anything other than give them instruction. Oftentimes when we call out to God, we have to have the courage to do exactly what he tells us to do. I want you to take notice in this text that none of the lepers stopped and ask for clarification. They didn't have any questions. They didn't have any follow-up. They didn't say why. They didn't say when. They didn't say, well, what time we need to be there. They didn't have a laundry list of things that they wanted to ask and get clarity about. They simply went 
on their way. They got the instruction and went on their way. I began to make me think about when was the last time that God gave me an instruction and I did not hesitate in the slightest. I did not I did not hem and haw. I didn't decide and struggle about whether or not I was going to be obedient to the thing that he told me to do. When was the last time God gave you a directive and you just did it? No questions asked. It's something so refreshing about this because what it does to is it, 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 it sort of reinforces to me what their trust level was. When you trust something, you don't, you don't question it. When you trust something, you don't hesitate. When I trust, usually when I have difficulty trusting in something or somebody, I ask a lot of questions. I get a lot of clarity. I sort of make sure I heard. Did I hear what I said? I mean, so let me understand this. So you want me to do X and then you're going to do Y. I sort of make sure that the expectations are clear and you know what you're doing and I know what I'm doing so that we can come and do this thing together. But none of this takes place in this text. They ask for help. They're, ex they're on the margins of the culture. They ask for help. And Jesus responds. He just responds and says, go show yourselves to the priest. Then something else really, really miraculous happens here. The scripture tells us that as they were going, they were healed. I am fascinated by that because it tells me that there are rewards with obedience and trusting in God. So when we obey God and when we trust God and we do what he has called us to do without hesitation and without flinching, that our blessing, our manifestation is in that obedience. They hadn't even gotten to the priest yet. They hadn't even gotten to their destination. And the scripture tells us as they were going, they were blessed. As they were going, they were healed. And while they're on their way, it's 10 lepers. One is like, hold on, wait a minute. Something, something's going on here. Wait a minute, I'm a, wait a minute, I, I, hold on, I'm healed. He didn't even go all the way to the priest. The other nine kept going. Oftentimes when this text is talked about, Frank, they oftentimes try to make it feel or seem as if the other nine are ungrateful, but the other nine are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. He told them, go show yourselves to the priests. He's they're following instructions. I don't think that that's ungrateful. He says, go show yourselves to the priests. And that's exactly what they do. But the one is so compelled that he recognizes his transformation. He recognizes the immediate fruit of being obedient. He's like, wait a minute, I don't feel what I feel, what I felt before. I don't look the same way I look. Something is, is happening. And in this revelation, what compelled him to go back is his recognizing who Jesus was. He said, wait a minute, I knew he had a, 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 a miracle ministry. I knew he had a healing ministry, but hold on a minute, is, is, is this guy? And it says that he goes back, he's compelled to return to Jesus. He's like, I got to give some further inquiry. I, be, I have already been transformed. I haven't made it back to the priest. I have got to go back and see. And it says that when he came back to say thank you, he did something that many of us forget to do. He worshiped. He worshiped. It says that he not only thanked God, but it says that he bowed down. If you was to peel back the layers on that text, begins to tell us how he played himself prostrated because he recognized the divinity that is in Jesus this isn't just a man 
who is in touch with the father, something different is happened here. I've got an instant manifestation of, uh, of, of blessings, of transformation. My life isn't the same. That's typically what happened when you have an encounter with Jesus. Your life is not the same. There's a transformation that takes place. And, and like the leper, you will see the transformation in your obedience. For him, it was skin. For you, it might be your heart. You might just end up being nicer than you was yesterday, kinder than you was yesterday. You might be more grateful than you was yesterday. You might be more, uh, just more loving. And as a result, what happens is your relationships transform. And the people that I used to argue with all the time and always bumping heads, all of a sudden something is happening because I've had this encounter with Jesus. It's not that they have changed have changed because I've had this encounter with Jesus. Jesus has touched me in a way and I've obeyed what he said to do. He told me to pray for them that so despitefully use me. He said to bless my enemies. He said to treat my neighbor as myself. And when I started getting lost and caught up into those instructions Jesus gave me as I obeyed them, I was transformed in a way that I could have never been transformed. There is something that happens when you encounter Jesus. Something that happens when you encounter Jesus. Gratitude is good for your health. It's not just good for your spirit, but it's good for your physical health. Gratitude is a way of showing appreciation, gratitude in relationships, build good will. It acknowledges the sacrifices of someone on the other side. It lays the groundwork for positive relationships. It fosters security. It inspires worship. So many things that, that it does for you when you are grateful. Grateful is, gratitude is transforming. Gratitude physiolo phys physiologically increases oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone. It fosters calm. Do you not know that counting your blessings Research has shown boosts your health. It lessens your depression and your stress. It lowers blood pressure. It increases energy and optimism. Gratitude can transform you body, mind, and spirit. It breaks and interrupts cortisol from producing, which is the stress hormone that can deplete your immune system and raise your blood sugar. We could transform our health just by being more grateful. Transform our physical health, transform our spiritual health. This leper came back and Jesus makes note that he was a Samaritan. I believe what Jesus is trying to communicate to us is the kingdom that he is going to be establishing where there is no Jew, no Gentile, no, no slave or free, but that by his blood, we are all made whole. We all can find our completeness in him. It's here where we see that the gospel message is, in fact, an inclusive message that doesn't leave anybody out. Jesus, in his ministry, goes out of his way to visit the margins of our culture just so that he can be a blessing to someone who he doesn't have to be a blessing to, but who everybody else has forgotten. The lepers were expelled from the culture. They were isolated in a way that no one was coming for them. But here comes Jesus passing by. This is yet another place in biblical text where we see how Jesus goes out of his way to be a blessing to others. And as a result, 
this healed man, this whole man, returns with a spirit of gratitude. Gratitude has transformed his physical life, his mental life, his spiritual life. And Jesus begins to tell him, wasn't it none of you? And Jesus isn't trying to throw shade toward the other nine, but he wants to remind to know that it was he who was doubly marginalized. He was not just on the margins of the culture because he had leprosy. He was also on the margins of culture because he was a Samaritan. He was excluded, not just because he had a disease, but he was also excluded for who he was. He who had so much to gain with an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. And I begin to say, well, wait a minute. He was already healed, Frank. He was already made well in his obedience and going. But what that is trying to say, tell us when Jesus said this, is that no, he was physically healed. But his faith in me, when he came back and recognized who I was, put him in intimate relationship with me. So he was not just healed, he was saved. I wonder how gratitude might transform us this week. I wonder how gratitude might transform our minds from pessimism to optimism. I wonder how it might transform our ability to interact with others. I wonder what gratitude might do. And it reminded me of my time in Poland when I was consumed with saying thank you. When I was consumed with saying thank you because it was the only thing I know I knew at that time, but I wonder what life would be like for my physical health, for my mental health, for my spiritual health. If I would just practice gratitude, it is so easy to complain. You ever notice how contagious complaining is? Somebody could be complaining and ain't even in a bad mood and all of a sudden, your dog getting on your nerves, your cat won't use the litter box, nothing's going right. Remember that complaining is contagious. It's like a cancer. It eats away at our faith, our self-esteem, our mental health. It has nothing good to give us but gratitude. Gratitude is doing something for us that complaining never could. It's changing the chemicals in our body. Oxytocin is going off the charts. And what is happening is it is transforming our lives. It's transforming our relationship. And it is doing something that we all need. It's inspiring us to worship. It's inspiring us to recognize who God is and who he is in me, who he is in you. Somebody didn't wake up this morning, so the fact that you and I are looking at each other is already a reason to give him thanks, already a reason to worship. The fact that we have clean drinking water is a luxury that most of the world does not have. We have so much to be thankful for. So much to be grateful for. And though things aren't the way we would like them to be, they aren't as good as they wanted to be. I didn't drive a Mercedes here this morning and I didn't leave a mansion when I came here. Oh, but he's still worthy. I still have a reason to be thankful. You still have a reason to be thankful. And so maybe we'll correct the narrative of this biblical story in our minds that this one leopard 
got doubly blessed. His physical body was blessed, but it was his gratitude, his ability to say thank you that transformed his eternal life. And the reason why he became a citizen of heaven is because gratitude inspired his salvation and his belief in Jesus. He recognized who Jesus was. So my encouragement to you today is to say thank you. Is to say thank you and to live your life in thanks to the one who gave it to you. So today and all day, it's Jenkuye. Thank you, Lord. It is mercy. It is gracias. It's grassy. It's thank you, God, for all the ways that you show up for me. Even when I don't show up for myself. For all the ways that you keep proving to me that you are God and besides you. There is none other. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Jenkuye. Thank you for all the ways that you've been so good. Thank you for all the ways that you've been so kind. Thank you for brand new mercies on this morning. Thank you for the sun shining. Thank you for keeping us well. Even while we slept and slumbered, God, you was watching over us. You were being God even when we were slumbering. Thank you, God, for not just all the things that you've done and all the things that you continue to do, but thank you for all the ways you're going to show up on tomorrow because you are faithful. We honor you today, God, because you have been so good to us. You've been so consistent, God. Who is man that you are so mindful of us? Thank you, God, for being mindful of us. Thank you for blessing us in ways that we don't even recognize in this moment. We continue to give your name glory, honor, and praise because you are and remain worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Does any Thank you for joining us today. If the people of Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church may be of service to you, please email us at mvpumcbaltimore at gmail.com. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you until we can meet again. God be with you.